So um, yeah, well, thank you. And I guess we'll, we'll move on next to uh, Norm Norman. Um, Norm Norman was born in Edmonton, uh, joined the Canadian Armed Forces in 2004 as an infantry officer. And after uh, finishing his undergraduate studies, and then going on to get a diploma in logistics management at the University of Alberta. Um, he eventually transferred to the uh, Royal Canadian Navy to see some new places. Since joining the Navy, uh, Norm has deployed to South America, Asia, and Europe to coordinate and provide logistical support to uh, uh, operations in those regions. In 2013, he completed the ammunition technical officer course in the UK and also an MBA from the University of Liverpool, specializing in international business. He's also been the Chief Procurement Officer at the Canadian Forces Base in Halifax, Commanding Officer at the Canadian Forces Ammunition Depot in Rock Point, and completed his Master of Defense Studies where he wrote a dissertation about airships, um, providing some support for, uh, for Canada's Arctic. And that's the source of his interest in, in airships, uh, which will be, hearing more about today. So, um, so um, go ahead, Norm. Okay, thanks very much for the intro. Uh, that's right, my name is Norm Norman because my parents are funny. Uh, my, uh, my presentation today is on sovereignty and northern supply. In the top right corner there, you can see a uh, picture of a Coast Guard vessel at the fuel facility in Nana Civic. That's on the coast of uh, Baffin Island. Both the Coast Guard and the Navy use that facility for logistical resupply. In the bottom picture there, you've got a barge on the Mackenzie River, which we've discussed today in Katrina's presentation. That's actually during uh, the, the summer months, uh, a line of communication that uh, cargo gets transferred uh, up and down from like from the communities in Slave Lake all the way up to uh, the Tuk Tuk and along the Arctic coast. So just a lot of people don't understand that that is an actual legitimate line of communication that's used in the north for northern supply. And we're going to talk about that and, and a, a lot of other things in a sec. So without further ado, I'll advance the slide. He said, ah, here we go. Okay, so who's this guy? Uh, thanks for the intro. I'm not going to spend a lot of time here. I'm a Navy Lago logistician. Uh, I also have a specialty in ammo. I've deployed all over the place. I've got 18 years of service. And uh, I found out about airships because uh, of a Master's of Defense study degree I did. Uh, they were looking for a problem set, or problems, uh, sorry, a solution set to the problem of sustainment in the Arctic. And uh, after finding out about this whole airship thing, uh, I started my own consulting business because I really do believe this is going to be the future for Canada. And uh, there's just stuff I can do as a private citizen that I'm not able to do as a military person. So having that flexibility enables me to, uh, to advance this uh, accordingly. Uh, I've also been to some schools. Uh, I got an MBA, uh, Master of Defense Studies, like I said, and uh, Bachelor of Arts and all that great stuff. So we don't need to belabor that. Okay, I'm sure we've seen this uh, quote before. Uh, if some countries have too much history, we have too much geography from William Lyon Mackenzie King. I mean, what is that? What we're talking about here really is the 30% of Canada's landmass that is accessible via low cost uh, conventional modes of transportation, meaning the remaining 70% is difficult to access because of climate and weather. I don't have to, I don't have to, to educate anybody here in this form, I don't think, on that aspect of it. Uh, the 90% of Canadians that live within 160 kilometers of the US border basically means that the majority of the population and the transportation infrastructure that services that population is clustered in the southernmost region of the country. So, why am I, as a naval logistician, interested in this? Well, uh, national defense is a public good. Uh, the Canadian Armed Forces, sometimes I'll call it the CAF, C-A-F, we love our uh, acronyms in the military, uh, well, we're mandated to perform national defense on behalf of the government of Canada. National defense is not limited to the southernmost regions, despite that's where the, the clusters of population and transportation infrastructure are. <clears throat> so because we're tasked with uh, defending the entirety of the nation, a solution is required so we're able to conduct operations in the entirety of the nation efficiently, efficiently and in a manner that's uh, sensitive to local demands. So, so that's, that's why I'm interested. <laughs> we'll move on to the next, uh, the next slide here. So where does that leave us? Well, in 1914, we're going to be doing a little bit of a history lesson here. Uh, map maker John Bartholomew produced an isochronic map that illustrates the length of time it takes to travel from London to various destinations around the world. From this map, uh, we can see that in 1914, it took over 40 days uh, to access the Canada's Arctic from London. So I'll just highlight the, uh, the little blue box there is the legend. So you see in red, you've got five days, five to 10, 10 to 20, 20 to 30, 30 to 40, and over 40 in the darkest blue right here. So let's, uh, let's flash forward about a century. Uh, in 2016, Rome to Rio produced an updated map. And even after over that century, the High Arctic remains one of the least accessible locations. Many of the islands in the High Arctic are not covered by Rome to Rio's 2016 map even. Um, we can, 
and we must do better. That's the bottom line. Okay, so what do we have to work with in Canada's earth? Like I said, that little, I'll brief this map sort of generally from west to east. So that big blue oval on both maps there uh, is that, that Mackenzie River line of communication I was talking about uh, between Tuk 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 and uh, <clears throat> the communities in, in Greater Slave Lake, Hay River being one of them there, identified on the map. Um, there's a floating dry dock in Tuk 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 for emergency repairs, just giving you familiarity for the infrastructure that, that we have to work with here. Uh, the, and um, this line of communication is not really open for longer than the summer, although with exacerbating climate change, potentially that window will get, will get wider. But, uh, but yeah, that, that's basically the situation in, in that region from a log logistician's perspective. Uh, moving now east, uh, Churchill, Manitoba, currently does not have a road, as you can see from the map on the right. However, it is uh, serviced by rail. It does have a seaport and a regional airport with uh, access to Winnipeg. Uh, planes are, uh, plans sorry, are underway uh, for a road to connect the region, which would establish redundancy along that existing rail line of communication that uh, connects Churchill uh, via, round, via ground. And then moving, continuing to move east, Moosonee, it's not connected to Canada's uh, transportation network by road, uh, much like Churchill. However, there is a rail line of communication to Moosonee and uh, a regional airport. Uh, it's relative proximity to Ontario and, and Quebec, to Southern Ontario and Quebec specifically, position it as a, as a really prime candidate for an, a node in Eastern Canada. And I'll get into what I mean by node in a, in a, in a little bit. Uh, and then continuing east, uh, CFB Goose Bay in Labrador City. I just want to talk briefly about those. Uh, Goose Bay is an Air Force Bay, Canadian Air Force Base. Um, it can handle a variety of aircraft, C-17s included. Um, it makes it a candidate also for a, a node. However, uh, airships can be big. Uh, airspace can be constrained. So maybe that's not the best option for a node for pushing a bunch of cargo up. Maybe the better option is Labrador City, which does have, have rail linkages via the uh, Quebec North Shore Labrador Railway, QNSL. So um, yeah, that's sort of the situation out, out Labrador way. Uh, another key location in the Arctic is Nana Civic. We saw that on the first slide I, I put up there. Uh, that's the fuel facility on Baffin Island. It's identified there on, on the map. And uh, basically if it, the concept here is that the, the, Navy and, well, the Canadian government will push uh, fuel and resources up there so that when the Navy and the Coast Guard are conducting operations in that region, they have somewhere to refuel. Uh, basically, the concept is have it sparsely crewed, but there will inevitably be consumable items used for maintenance and repair that will periodically need to be shipped up to Nana Civic. So it will have to require some sustainment of its own, um, which brings us to uh, a Callowit as another option for uh, providing that sustainment. So there's, th there could be a very interesting relationship between a Callowit and this Nana Civic vis-a-vis -vis, uh, sustainment. get into that in a moment. Okay, so this is what I proposed um, for a circuit, basically to connect the entire Arctic region. Uh, airships would uh, transit this circuit and each of those nodes indicated with green and blue stars would act as sort of a hub and spoke concept. So cargo could be pushed up to those locations. Uh, the green stars indicate by ground air, uh, the blue stars indicate only by air or sea. Uh, but basically you could pre-situate the cargo you needed until such time as one of the airships made its way along this route to collect that cargo and deliver it to wherever it needs to go in the region. Um, yeah, okay, the, uh, let's just, here, okay, and then I'll go into the map on the right. The area inside the green arc reflects a distance an airship with a 150 kilometer an hour cruising speed could travel in a 12 hour period uh, in any direction away from a potential node in Hay River. Wasn't aware of the flooding going on there, but um, I still think it's a good candidate for a node. That's, that was remarkable footage that uh, we saw in the last presentation. Uh, as we can see from this map though, only one airship delivering cargo as described would necessitate a redrawing of that 2016 isochronic map. It would make all of the Canadian Arctic accessible for cargo movement inside 24 hours. So it is possible to do better. Okay, <clears throat> so increasing the number of airships uh, to two, if we add another one sort of based out of Moosonee and a third, say, in a Callowit, uh, it'll increase the, the, the response time accordingly. So you've got on the left, the proposed circuit with, with two airships, one in Moosonee, one in Hay River. On the right, uh, three, one based out of a Callowit as well. Um, basically, in these scenarios, we're able to push cargo into the Arctic. It, in a before unseen like uh, level of a, a timeline, which is what, what I think is why it's the way ahead. Uh, conventional, so 
hang on, hang on a sec. Sorry, I, I gotta get back here. Okay, yeah, there's another aspect to this too. So one of the limitations of conventional air power is they have to spend a much greater percentage of the time on the ground than in the air. Airships represent a great hybrid of air and sea power, actually, because yes, we're subject to severe weather in the airship space, but they, we, and yes, they need to be refueled and maintained, but they can spend upwards of 300 days operational in the sky. That's like, that's significantly not the case in a, with conventional aircraft. Uh, it's this persistence in the air domain, basically, that, that presents an opportunity for cargo movements with, with, cargo, you can effectively have an airship loitering in the area, and it can be deployed within 12 to 24 hours to wherever it's required. So uh, this is this is where I propose a, a circuit that would be that would enable cargo delivery to any kind of scenario that the military could come up with to anywhere in the Arctic within a relatively short period of time. Um, military exercises and operations in the region, you may have heard of one, it's called Op Nanook. Uh, basically, that's where we simulate a aircraft that has crashed in the Arctic region, and we test ourselves at our ability to respond to that crash. Um, we have a lot of lessons learned that come out of that, and a lot of lessons learned focus on how inaccessible the region is. This makes that not a problem anymore. So I'm, I'm really hoping that, that the military does look at this seriously, because I think there's a lot of scope for us to do our jobs a lot more effectively with some airship solutions at, at work. Um, okay, yeah, we'll, we'll leave it there for now. So let's go on to the next one. I think, I think I've belabored that point enough. Let's talk a little bit about sovereignty now. So sovereignty issues. Um, first, I'd like to draw your attention to a little stretch of water called the Nair Strait. It's between Ellesmere Island and Greenland. Um, I've proposed that this could reconfigure the Arctic shipping routes through, uh, through our waters uh, over the next well, up 20, 30 years as the sea, sea ice becomes continually melted throughout the Arctic Ocean. So this Nair Strait connector is something I just want to highlight because it's going to become important, I think, going forward. Um, there have been very low levels of reported passages uh, over the Nair Strait since the region was first subject to exploration. Um, but it has been noted that it would be a, by people smarter than me, <laughs> who, who, who are academics and have more degrees uh, behind their name than me, that it, uh, it, it's, it could be a feeder to the trans sea route or transpolar sea route, the TSR, and the Northwest Passage. This would help in, improve shipping times and, and send cargo through the area with a lot greater alacrity. Um, okay, now Denmark's not traditionally associated with being an adversary or a competitive uh, nation with us. Uh, there, there, there have been the, the Hans Island thing, I think people are aware of, that is in the Nair Strait. Um, but there's also the, there's a dispute regarding the Lomonosanov Ridge. This is, uh, the Canadian government basically claims that it's an extension of the Ellesmere Island. So that's the area circled in red. Uh, Denmark claims that the ridge is an extension of Greenland. So that's where, if you've heard of the Lomonosanov Ridge, you may have heard of that dispute as well. And um, why do we care about all this? I mean, the, the reason is all about if we are able to regulate traffic, if we're, the concept is if we're able to regulate traffic, if we're able to apply Canadian laws in some fashion in the region, then we're exercising sovereignty in the region, which is currently we're not doing it, or we are, but we're competing with the Danes. So, so if we keep that concept in our head, we, the Canadian government exercises sovereignty by regulating whatever government laws that have been produced in Canada in a region, if we're able to do that, then we're expressing sovereignty in that region. So just, to, just to bear that in mind, that, that's why we're so picky and, and, and hung up on little patches of water that, that shipping traffic needs to go through. So neither Canada nor Denmark has sought to deny the right of innocent passage through the Nair Strait yet. Um, however, innocent passage is uh, one of those things that a country can exercise sovereignty by denying or revoking or temporarily suspending uh, for the sake of espionage. Now we're going to get into a little bit of a secret squirrel talk here, but that's okay. I'll, I'll keep it light. But uh, yeah, basically since 1950, uh, it's been common for Chinese, British, North Korean, American, Soviet, now Russian submarines uh, to be used for undersea spying with regularity. So in, and in intrusions into territorial waters uh, of other sovereign states, that's not uncommon with this type of espionage activity. Well, for Canadian sovereignty to be expressed over this region, we need to be able to first uh, detect that there is a submarine there and tell them, hey, go away. We don't want you here. What are you doing here? So we have those capabilities, but we don't have the capability yet to project that as efficiently as we probably could. So, yeah, th th this is this is where sovereignty uh, comes comes into play big time is when, when it comes to other 
state or non-state actors being able to access patches of Canadian territory uh, to do whatever they want with and for us to not know about it and not be able to regulate it means that the questions if it's even really ours so anyway that, that, that's the Denmark issue with the Nehr Strait uh, I, I will note here uh, that the, the Lomasanov Ridge also and the um, Menendelev rises or rise uh, were claimed by Russia as their they, they claim that is their continental sea shelf uh, so people talk about Russian uh, claiming the North Pole but their claim actually stops at the North Pole so the Lomasanov rise right now, ridge, sorry, right now, uh, does not. There's no claims that Russia is making that overlaps with our own claims. That being said, Russia sometimes does different things that we're not expecting. Uh, that's all I'm going to say on that. Okay. Uh, the next slide here. So the Northwest Passage is another sovereignty issue. We kind of danced around it, but now we're going to talk about it head on. It's another point of contention between Canada and the U.S. and arguably the world. The, the U.S., uh, along with most other maritime countries, acknowledges that, that Canada owns the Northwest Passage, but there's still a dispute over whether the Northwest Passage is Canadian internal waters or an international strait. Um, if it's Canadian internal waters, we can regulate it according to our own uh, laws and, and regulations. If, if it's not, we have to go with the UN Convention of the Law of the Sea, UNCLOS for short. So unfortunately, uh, or, for, you know, unfortunately, <laughs> it, it, a negotiated resolution, put it this way, a negotiated resolution is, is much more likely to come down that favors Canada's claim. If Canada can establish a history or a pattern of exercising governmental functions in the region. Uh, the existence of our Canadian stricter than UNCLOS uh, environmental regulations, it, it helps position us to apply those regulations because of Canadian standards uh, and exert sovereignty over that, that critical piece of transportation. It's not infrastructure, but it's a, it's a line of communication, that critical line of communication. Um, uh, so there's a surveillance. It's okay, so let's back up a bit more. So if we're able to uh, regulate uh, or, or enforce Canadian laws uh, over the region, we're able to exert sovereignty. Um, there's an opportunity for other government uh, departments, such as Transport Canada, Defar Department of Fisheries and Oceans, the RCMP, CBSA, to utilize all that information that airships could be gathering as they're transiting that circuit uh, to potentially levy fines or say, hey, you're being non-compliant with shipping regulation X, Y, Z. Uh, here's a fine, whatever. Oh, hey, by the way, as you make your way past this port, we're going to be impounding your vessel because we need to search it because we saw something, right? So that the bottom line is detection of and, and punishment for non-compliance with uh, Canadian environmental and transportation regulations that are more stringent with UNCLOS meets the definition of exercising sovereignty. Uh, by using airships to detect non-compliance would be effectively exercising it sovereignty over the Northwest Passage, regardless of any ongoing dispute over if it's an internal to Canada water or not. If we start regulating it, the dispute can go on forever. That's great, fine. But we've, we've established a history of sovereignty over that particular region, and that's what we need to start doing. Okay. Okay. <laughs> another another interesting sovereignty uh, angle that we can take on this uh, is emerged from uh, the uh, hamlet in Nunavut called uh, Kiki Tarjuit, and I hope I got that pronunci pronunciation right. I'm going to practice a few times throughout the presentation, so if somebody from uh, who speaks in Nunavut can correct it, go right ahead. Uh, I'm happy to take that 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 correction. Uh, anyway, Section 35 of the Constitution Act establishes constitutional protection to Indigenous peoples' rights, and Canada's Supreme Court has confirmed that Indigenous people hold title to their lands uh, based on their occupation and governance. The courts have specifically affirmed that uh, the Inuit hold Indigenous title to their territories in Canada. In this case, we see some overlapping sovereignty over the Arctic region. I mean, in theory, if the interests of the Indigenous peoples inhabiting their lands are aligned with the Canadian government's interests, friction between those two stakeholder groups that there's not going to occur. Unfortunately, these interests are not always aligned. Uh, an example of this uh, could translate into a threat to Canadian sovereignty. And th that's what we can be. That's what we see in the hamlet of Kiki Tarjuik. Um, OK, it's it's a, the location of Kiki Tarjuik along the Northwest Passage and potentially along the uh, um, sorry, the Narra Strait connector uh, with relative close proximity to the Arctic bridge route. It makes it a very strategically compelling location uh, with respect to Canadian and Inuit sovereignty. It's got a small population, only about 500 people, and it's situated right at the entrance of the Northwest Passage. It has a good protected harbor, uh, it has good anchorage, and it has a moderate tidal range. Um, 
so not only does it have geography in its, in its favor, uh, there's also valuable fishing grounds in the area. At the moment, most fishing vessels in the region transit across the Davis, Davis Strait slash Baffin Bay, which is a stretch of open Arctic water, to Greenland to offload fish, refuel, and conduct crew changes. Uh, a deep water port that was situated in Kikitarjuic could feasibly uh, support a processing plant near the fishing grounds, open opportunities for selling shrimp locally, and create more jobs like net making and welding. If a fish processing capability was established in Kikikarjuic, uh, an entire Canadian fishery, fishery would have essentially vertically integrated a portion of its supply chain um, because of the shortened and because of the shortened transit time uh, associated with the airship circuit, talking 12 hours, 24 hours, it'd be possible to leverage that to ship perishable commodities like fish or seafood to national or international markets, thus streamlining the supply chain even further. So. Uh, what does this have to do with sovereignty? Well, the, the ha Hamlet's director of finance, Arthur Nicomedes, acknowledged that both the federal government and the government of Nunavut have already helped, but this help is insufficient in actually executing the construction of the port facility, which has an estimated price tag of $50 million. As we saw in the previous presentation, nothing up there is cheap. Uh, Nick Meadey stated that while some foreign investors have already come forward, uh, the Hamlet is extending an invitation to quote unquote, wealthy Chinese businessmen. Like as a military person, that, that makes my blood run cold. Like that's a, what are we doing now? So we have to rely on maybe foreign investors who we don't know what their motivations are to deliver like <laughs> economic prosperity to a region in our own country. Like, ah, that doesn't sit well uh, from a national defense perspective. Uh, is, is that part of the Arctic really Canada anymore then? Uh, we can start asking those questions and not having comfortable answers to them. Okay, so what do we need to do? Uh, a stakeholder approach is absolutely required. What do I mean by that? Well, what, <laughs> what I proposed here with my circuit and all that, that's an idea from a white guy from Edmonton who joined the Navy, who came up with this while examining the environment through military issue lenses. So mine is certainly not the only voice. And, and if all I've done is to create a straw man that gets reconfigured, but starts a discussion that ends with a better quality of life for the inhabitants of Canada's Arctic, I'm gonna go ahead and call that a win. So. That's where it becomes difficult. And I was really glad that Katrina mentioned uh, on the stakeholder side, um, the, the aspect of, of burnout through consultation. I don't remember the exact word that she used or the phraseology there, but it, it's worth noting that yes, we have to meaningfully consult and we have to adopt the stakeholder approach, but th there's so many people involved, we cannot overload the, the communities uh, with information uh, about, oh, we want to know uh, this and this and this and this and this so that we can meaningfully consult with you and de develop a solution that you definitely need that, okay, get a, take a number, you know, federal government department, uh, five letter acronym X. You know, so we have to be sensitive to that. Um, and we have to remember that communities like Kiki Terjuic are just one Arctic community. There's 78 other Arctic communities, all with unique interests. Um, but the common challenge throughout the region is a lack of connectivity to the transportation networks of the rest of the world. So I think airships can, can definitely definitely help with that. And I believe there's also little doubt that there would be demand for an airship sort of cargo service, the, the delivery service to occupy a position between the, the once per year sea lift shipment that a lot of these communities get and that very, very expensive airlift shipments that, uh, these, that, that, that is the only other alternative for, for shipping in uh, material. Um, okay, yeah. And I really like with this airship uh, concept too, the, the, the move toward hydrogen and electric propulsion. But 40 years ago, uh, Arctic was predicted to be one of the Earth's most sensitive climate regions. Uh, yeah, it turns out it is. <laughs> That's, so they, they, were, they were validated, unfortunately, I guess. Uh, so the concept of a hydrogen fueled airship that produces very few greenhouse gases would certainly seem to be a solution to Arctic shipping that would receive buy-in from the communities in the region. Um, so we, there is a, there's definitely a need to consult with these communities and with the regions, uh, sorry, and with representatives from those communities, but not over consult. So that's a piece that I'm still now having a process that uh, Katrina brought up, brought up. So again, I'm, I'm really glad we're having this type of discussion. Um, right, so to be effective uh, at improving connectivity throughout the region, we have to socialize it. Uh, how that happens, I don't know, but we cannot just have a military imposed solution for transportation in the Arctic region and think there'll be no issues. That, that approach has been heavy handed and has not worked in the past. I don't think it's gonna work in the future either. Okay, Norm, so you kind of laid us with some heavy stuff. We got submarines spying on us. We got uh, Russia and Denmark and people going through the strait. Okay, well, how do we get out of this problem? I don't know how we get out of this problem, but I got a couple ideas. So 
UNCLOS granted governance, management, and jurisdiction uh, of the Arctic Ocean to five countries. Canada is one of those five countries. Just we're one of five. If Canada's not meeting its responsibility, Canadians need to speak up. It, it's our responsibility. If we, if we neglect it, what we're producing is an inequitable protection of Canadian rights. Basically, that creates space for a sovereignty void. When there's a void, something wants to come fill that void. No single uh, government department has, has been exclusively assigned responsibility for Canada's Arctic region in all aspects. So if no one is responsible, then everyone must be. And that, that's the point I want to bring home here. Uh, more people need to take an interest, pose questions to their elected representatives regarding how Canada monitors traffic in its maritime approaches, specifically the Arctic region. And more people need to ask why we don't have a transportation solution to fulfill our, our Arctic governance responsibilities. More people need to ask why food costs need to differ from Yellowknife to York region, that's in Toronto, uh, when technological solutions exist already that can smooth out pricing from coast to coast to coast. So these are questions that need asking. This, this is, it needs to be a whole of government approach that, 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 with consultation. And, and how does the government get motivated to do anything? It's by, by people that give them their jobs and elect them, but poking them and asking them hard questions and difficult questions to answer. So. Anyway, I'll leave it there. Um, I talk really fast. I realized that I threw a lot of concept, a lot of information at everyone. Um, and I'm happy to take some questions now. Um, let me just, I'll stop sharing so I can see everybody again. Hey, Norm, I'll ask you one, one of the yeah. questions. We have several in the, in the Q&A and, and if you have time to answer some um, through the Q&A, then that, sure. that might be great because we, I don't want to take too much time since we're already at 1030. But, um, but, but one of the questions, what's the biggest blocker? Um, it's been on the cards for a long time. The biggest, sorry, is that on the Q&A? Blocker. Q Blocker. It's in the Q&A. Yeah. Oh, yeah, got what it there. What is the okay. biggest blocker? Uh, nobody wants... No, it's, nobody wants to, to take this up as a responsibility. There's no OPI. There's no Office of Primary Interest for this. That is it. The military says, yes, we want to do okay. uh, surveillance. We want to do uh, air, air for, uh, aircraft recovery when there's a downed airplane in, in the Arctic. So airships are a way to do that. Awesome. Okay. Uh, well, we don't have money. We don't have a budget to pay for it. That's not, it's not 100% our mandate. Uh, maybe Department of Transportation. Let's talk to them. Okay. Yeah, but we don't really have the same surveillance requirement. The biggest blocker is there's no, there's no single point of contact that's taking this and championing it. I Does see. that answer the question? I yeah. see. Yeah. So you'd have, to col you'd have to make it more collaborative and everybody kind of kicks the ball into somebody else's court. So, it's like herding yeah. cats. we got to herd the cats. Yeah, that makes sense. Well, we'll see if we have more time at the end. Um, and, but thanks a lot. This, that was fascinating. Um, and uh, let me let me go ahead and jump on to uh, move on.